It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. I'm really happy to have Armando Iannucci back on the show. He's the creator of so much amazing comedy. He created the TV show The Thick of It for the BBC in 2005, which is a political comedy about the fictional Department of Social Affairs and Citizenship in England. It's one of my absolute favorite TV shows. Every scene of every episode is an amazing, hilarious swirl of, I guess, well-meaning incompetence, plus some really, truly creative swearing. Yes, let's cause a little bit of friction. Let's fire someone. What about Glenn? No, no. you can't just fire Glenn well, like we, that. We, we could fire Glenn. Shall I get his file? No, I've got a list. It's... See, there you are, he's got a list. You're a new broom. You're sweeping up trouble with one end, broom handling incompetent staff up the tunnel with the other. So, Malcolm, how do we play it at The Guardian? Smile, be gay. Yeah. Smile, smile, smile. The Thick of It was spun into a movie called In the Loop, which is also pretty fantastic. And then in 2012, he created a sort of semi-American remake of the show called Veep. Veep now has 17 Emmy Awards, including a record-breaking six in a row for the brilliant Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Iannucci left Veep following its fourth season, but he's kept busy. He just wrote and directed his second feature film. It's called The Death of Stalin. It's set in Russia in 1953. Joseph Stalin is dying from a cerebral hemorrhage, and around him there's a power struggle in the Politburo. That's his advisory committee. That's the central conflict of the film, who will lead Russia. There's his deputy secretary, George Malenkov, played by Jeffrey Tambor, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, played by Michael Palin, Lavrenti Beria, the head of the Internal Security Force, played brilliantly by Simon Russell Beale, and Nikita Khrushchev, played by Steve Buscemi. The characters are all classic Iannucci. They're ambitious, they're chaotic, they're all deeply, deeply insecure. And like in Veep or The Thick of It, they betray one another at every turn, then feign concern and friendship when it's politically convenient. Except that in the case of the death of Stalin, the stakes are much, much higher. The losers could get sent to prison camp or shot. Let's take a listen to a clip from the beginning of the movie. Stalin is collapsed on the floor of his dacha. His body lies in his bedroom for hours while the Politburo stands around him, worrying about what to do. The power vacuum that's been created is obvious as the staff maneuvers for power while trying to keep up appearances. The first voice you hear is Steve Buscemi as Nikita Khrushchev. Which doctor have you called? Oh, well, the subject's currently under discussion. Yes, as acting general secretary, I think that, uh, well, the committee should decide. The, com the committee? But our actual general secretary is lying in a puddle of indignity. I mean, I think he's saying, get me a doctor now. No, I don't, I don't agree. I think, uh, I think we should wait until we're quartered. Quartered? The room is only 75% conscious. Are you wearing pajamas? Yes, so? Why? Uh, because I act, Labrenti, decisively and with great speed. I said you'd be tested, and right now you're being tested by a shouty man wearing pajamas. Have you got a nappy under those, too? Too late for him. <laughs> <laughs> Armando Iannucci, welcome back to Bullseye. Hi. Good it's nice to, to see you. Congratulations on the movie. It's totally great. Oh, thank you very much. There we go. There's our poster. Yeah. I yeah. Will, <laughs> that would be, you're going to have a hard time selling tickets on the basis of that endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> That and banned in Russia. Yeah, I mean, two. at least try and get Elvis Mitchell to say something nice. <laughs> Somebody some people care about. Yeah. Um, I like what I like about that scene where they find Stalin nearly dead. Yes. On the ground. Yes. Is the extent to which it is urine centric. Yes, he is lying in a puddle of his own uh, indignity is in the <laughs> clip, but is, is urine. There's yeah. a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of like people starting to kneel, yep. realizing their <laughs> knee would go and pee and then get standing back up. And then we get into the question of seniority, who, when they get to lift the body, you know, which side do people, who's going to go on the pee side and who's not? <laughs> And, but a lot of it is true. That's the thing. And, you know, and it, Stalin did, I mean, he was killed by his own terror in that he, he terrified his guards and said that they were never to disturb him. So when he fell over with a stroke, which is what happened, guards outside held a, heard a thump. 
but they were too scared to knock on the door and they just left them there for a whole night and then day. And then, as in the clip, when the politicians arrive, they have a debate over whether to get a doctor or not because Stalin had put a lot of the Kremlin doctors on a list. He was going to get them shot because he was convinced they were out to poison him. So they just didn't, they were too scared to get, in case they got the wrong doctor. And, 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 and who, 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 ironically, would have um, cured Stalin uh, to the extent that Stalin would then find out that they did get the wrong doctor and then shoot the person who got the doctor. You know, the, the <laughs> thinking that was going on there was just went round of these hopes, you know. I mean, it is a um, <laughs> it, it is like a classic bureaucratic thinking scene when they yes. have the insight collectively mm. that if they get a bad that there are that Stalin has had killed or jailed all of the good doctors yes. because he believed them to be yes. plotting to poison him. Yes. And so if they get one of the other doctors and he does a good job, well then great, they got a good doctor to help him. Yes. If he does a bad job and he dies, then they don't have to worry about yes, but it. Yes, Stalin won't find out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So in the end, they get a doctor, you know, but they just round up some old retired doctors. It are... is it is very different stakes to mm. your other work. I mean, you've mm. done a lot of uh, the last 10, 15 years now, you've done a lot of humor about the ways that kind of systems and bureaucracies paralyze people. Yeah, and they're all fundamentally good people as well, I'd say. You know, they're politicians, but they're not criminals. Right. You know? and, and the mistakes they make are slightly either of their own doing or, 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 or the consequences really are reflect on them in terms of the embarrassment or the you know the awkward position they put them in this you know if someone makes a mistake they will either kill someone or be killed you know that's so the stakes are very very high i mean this, that's yeah. that's like a that's extraordinarily different i think that mm. there there is a whole world of comedy especially from the uk that's mostly about people trying to avoid being embarrassed yes Yes. And a lot, some of I your work all comedy in the UK. <laughs> falls into that category, yeah. right? It's like yeah. people going to extraordinary lengths to avoid embarrassment, which yes. dovetails beautifully with, you know, a democratic government where yeah. people are just trying to, you know, functionaries are just trying to function. That's right. Just get through the day without being found out, basically, yes. is like not being found wanting. But you know. what happens when the mm. consequence is not that you are embarrassed in front of people, but rather that you are uh, taken in front of a wall and shot? Uh, it's a different sort of comedy. It's, uh, <laughs> and also, you know, I made this film because I, 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 you know, all sorts of reasons, but I wanted to bring, take myself out of my comfort zone here. And, and I knew I was making a film in which not all the scenes would be funny. Um, I mean, it's it's funny throughout, uh, I hope. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. It is funny throughout, but it's also... Um, There's some long, dry stretches. It's, 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 worry, it's, it's worrying throughout, you know, right. it's anxiety-inducing throughout. And there are scenes specifically where there are no jokes, you know, in that I wanted... I think really because it, it's based on true events and, you know, millions of people were affected, millions of people were killed. And the first thing I said when we went into production was, I think we have to be very respectful of what happened to these people. This is no joke. So the comedy is almost, you know, to simplify it, the comedy is indoors, is in the Kremlin, and the consequences of that comedy is played for real outdoors, out on the streets. I mean, I have to say that when you, because you were in the process of making this film the last time you were on the show. Yeah. And when you described it to me, um, you know, in a very limited way, what mm. I imagined was a, a farce, you know, like a yeah. full on farce. Yeah. And there are elements of farce here. Yeah. But yeah. it's it's not it's not it's not a zany madcap romp. It's fast slash documentary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's not even that like, yeah. um, you know, like the uh, like in the Chris Morris movie Four Lions, mm -hmm. which is about a terror cell. Yeah. Um, the people in the terror cell are bumbling. Yeah. And yeah. they're dopes, you know, yeah. they're dopes just like anybody else. And that's what makes it funny is, oh, they have this terrifying power, but they're yeah. dopes just like anyone else. The characters in this film aren't exactly no. dopes no, either. No, they're in charge. And the thugs and they've been, you know, they've been doing this for 20 years. 
30 years. It's it's the old perennial, you know, struggle for succession. It's it's the Godfather and Game of Thrones and ancient Rome. And it's, you know, the emperor is dead and who's going to be the next emperor? I mean, what they used to do in Rome, of course, when, they, when the emperor died was... Um, and this happens in all big tyrannies, really, is when the, you know, when the tyrant dies, the potential successors all race as fast as they can to get to the capital. And then the first one there just starts killing everyone else, every other competitor, <laughs> so that there is absolutely no question that he's won. You know, and it's that. That's that's the stakes that, you know, and, and it must have been terrifying growing up under that kind of system and that mentality really there's everybody there's this amazing scene where everybody is at the dacha where he died mm. there all the politburo is there yeah and stalin's daughter who's the less insane of his two children mm -hmm. shows up and she's like getting out of a car and there's a literal race to greet her that's right everyone wants to be the first person to greet her um, it's, and the idea of these sort of middle to elderly, middle aged to elderly men all running through the forest to be the first to greet her and not look like they're utterly exhausted. Somebody said um, it was like a parody of um, a, a walk and talk scene from the West Wing, <laughs> like because they're, they're, you know, one of the characters turns to the other and says, how can you run and plot at the same time? Right. Yes. But like yeah. it, it really does. You know, it's like an inversion of the heroic vision of those yeah, kinds of shows. It's the, it's the West Wing with guns. Yeah, it's the West Wing as if produced by N the NRA. <laughs> Did you talk to anybody who had lived in the, or do you have anyone in your, in your life who had lived in this kind of world, a world where yeah. the state? was a you know was a constant traumatizing potentially deadly force in oh yeah lives. I mean a number of things I mean we went out to Moscow and did a lot of research just first of all just visually I wanted to get the look absolutely right so you know we went to Stalin's dacha went to the Kremlin went to the apartments you know looked at old Moscow and get that right um but also we spoke to people who'd grown up under Stalin and whose parents or grandparents had you know, been taken to gulags and, you know, and they told us little elements that we put in the movie that you would go to bed at night wearing lots of layers of clothes so that if you were dragged out in the middle of the night off to the gulag, you could at least, and you weren't given time to pack. If you had several layers of clothes on you, you had those. I met um, in London after a screening, I met a family, a Russian family, and he, the, uh, the, the, uh, the the father was 14 in Moscow when Stalin died and he, he walked into Moscow to go and see the body lying in state and he got caught up in the disturbances in the film there's the great crowd disturbances and it's again based on true events where you know 1400, 1500 people were killed and he was caught up in all that and uh, and he said he said two, he said two things the film it's true and it's funny, you know. <laughs> and we found out that they circulated joke books, jokes about Stalin and Beria, who was Stalin's chief kind of head of security, jokes about torture and rape and all sorts. And 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 you could be shot if you had one of these joke books on. And yet somehow, the need to make a joke about it, almost as if to say, you haven't got me yet. You know, if I can make fun of you, then you you haven't. You haven't taken away my mind, you know, or my spirit. Um, interesting, yeah. I want to play another scene from uh, my guest Armando Iannucci's new movie, The Death of Stalin. And this is the funeral of Stalin. Mm. So he has died. There's a spoiler for yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, the death of Stalin. The clue is in the title. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, and all of the various members of the Politburo are all kind of arrayed in a line in mm. front of the flowers and the casket and all this stuff, right? Mm. And um, so in, in this scene, there are some priests coming in from the Russian Orthodox Church who had previously been excluded. Yes, banned. Banned under Stalin, yes. Um, but, you know, part of this idea of we're going to reform after Stalin is we invite them to the funeral. Mm -hmm. And um, basically there's a game of telephone going on along this line of people uh, who are all members of the Politburo. Do you invite them? No. Ask Beria if he invited the bishops. Don't. 
Give me orders. Ask Barrier if he invited the bishops. Did you invite the bishops? Yes. Yes. Well? He said yes. I'm going to give everyone in Red Square a voucher permitting one kick each to a stupid face. Is he asking for some delicious hay? No, he said something quite complicated about a voucher system. Cross Nikita, why in God's ass he invited the bishops? No, it, I, I've already explained oh, why he... You tell him. Never mind. Swap. No. Just swap with me. I said no. We can make it look like it's part of the ceremony. <laughs> the then <laughs> obviously it won't work here, but the then is the biggest visual joke in the film <laughs> involving Steve Buscemi. <laughs> but I won't is, spoil it. Yes, yeah. okay. I, then I won't spoil it either. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it's we'll real it. funny. Yeah. It's real fun and funny. <laughs> I know because we've talked about it before what a big fan of the Larry Sanders show you ah, are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, which I think is, you know, one of the five or so best television shows ever. Ever. And um, Jeffrey Tambor, who plays the um, acting premiere. Yes. He is, um, he, he, he ascends to the premiership by virtue of having been the, the vice chairman. Yes. And uh, just, you know, somebody dies and, and he, he's kind of got to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I definitely see some parallels between Hank Kingsley, Absolutely. his character yeah, from yeah, the Larry yeah. Sanders show, who is a, just a pathetic, sweet, pathetic toady. Yeah. Um, that great episode where he has to front, the, where he hosts the show. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what I love about that episode where he hosts the show is that he does a good job. That's the genius of it. He does a good job, so he gets to do it again, and that's when it all goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting because when we were reading the script, it's funny, I'd ask Jeffrey, because Jeffrey's great, you know, from Hank and, and Arrested Development. So, you know, I, I, I was so pleased that he, he said yes, but it was as we were discussing the character that it both dawned on us that Malenkov, yeah, he's, so, he's Hank, isn't he, really? Yeah, and I was I was pleased that Jeffrey ventured that rather than me because I didn't want to just keep going on about Hank Adam. I think maybe the best performance in the film is Simon Russell Beale, mm. uh, who mm. plays uh, Beria, who is the um, like security guy, yes, the state murderer. That's right, <laughs> the yeah, murderer yeah. in chief. Yeah. yeah, he does some torturing too. Yeah, and Simon is I mean he's well known in the UK as a stage classical stage Shakespearean fantastic stage actor which is a thing they have in the UK just for our American audience <laughs> is well known classical stage actors <laughs> and he very rarely does uh, TV and film and I instantly thought of him for this part this is the first part I cast actually was Simon as Barry because uh, you know, I knew he would be great and he also can physically look a, a, a bit like Barrier, but also I like the idea that Barrier we don't have a, a notion of Barrier in the West, we don't have a, a conception of this character. And I kind of liked the idea that the film audience was not getting an actor where they were going, oh, that's that's him from that film, isn't it? That he was in the, you know, you're actually going, who is this? Well, it's Beria, that's who it is. And, uh, and, and then I liked the idea that him against, up against Steve Buscemi are two very different types of performer, playing two very different characters. And uh, the idea was in the course of the, you know, 100 minutes of the film, one person is the good guy and one person is the bad guy, as it were, to be very simplistic about it. But as the film progresses, you see subtle shifts in both those personas so that there's a very different feel to them by the end of the film. And I think it would be easy for him to play this character who is a brutal murderer the way that you would expect a bad guy in a Die Hard movie to be. Yeah. Which is to say, like, of, rubbing his hands yeah, together. Evil and, villain. Let's murder all of the all yeah. of the serfs will be yeah. murdered by yeah. us. Yeah. Um, and, but no, he, he has to play it as human, really, because that's what these people were, <laughs> you know, and, and, and there is that thing, you know, the banality of evil. I mean, the, people, people, aren't, people don't wake up saying, um, what evil thing will I do today? They wake up going, what will I do today? And it's just their predisposition or their misconstrued set of values that, that makes them do something which they think is, 
in their terms, perfectly fine. Actually, you know, morally, objectively, he's completely wrong. I mean, it seems like people, to some extent, mm. just operate in the, the whole world as a series of patterns and yeah. deviations from patterns. And so when something is... Yeah normal, even if it's not normal, even if it's yeah. murdering thousands of people or millions of people in the case yeah. of the, you know, Stalin over time. Yeah. Um, it, you know, you just are dealing with managing deviations from that crazy normal. And isn't it strange that whenever you see these people on trial, they, they, they all behave the same way, which is they're outraged that they should be put on trial. You see it in all the kind of footage of, you know, Gaddafi or in The Hague. And they're all saying, no, 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 you, this whole, this trial is a farce. You are conducting a farce. How dare you? You know, and they genuinely believe it. That's the thing. They're not putting this on. They genuinely, they've talked themselves into over the years, believing that what they think is right. And therefore, anyone who does anything contrary to that is, is wrong, is, is an enemy of the people. I like that you have taken that information. Yes, it is a farce. Yeah, it's called the Death of Stalin, <laughs> directed by Armando Iannucci. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear another scene from the Death of Stalin. So this is um, uh, this is. Let's see, which one am I going to play? I'm going to play this one with Molotov in it. Okay, here we go. So. <laughs> There is this immense power struggle that's going on. Yeah. Uh, there's Beria on one side who controls the uh, the in sort of like intelligence and sta yeah. and police state. The sort of KGB, really, as it were. Exactly. And then there's Khrushchev, who aspires to be a reformer and is also, you know, everyone in the movie is pretty weaselly. Um, so he's 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 not the he's not the purest of heroes himself, yeah. right? And so Khrushchev has run, literally run up the stairs to uh, visit uh, Vyacheslav Molotov, yes. who's played by Michael Palin. Yes. Khrushchev, played by Steve Buscemi. Mm -hmm. The elevator's broken, so he's, he's run. <laughs> throwing yeah. up from exhaustion from running up the stairs yeah. because uh, Palin's character, Molotov, who was on the kill list 24 hours earlier yes. is now an essential vote in this yes. bureau yes. as to what's going to happen. And uh, they're in this scene, um, they're in the toilet. Yes. Uh, they're not in the bowl of the toilet. They're in the toilet Pretty room. Pretty close to it, though. The bathroom, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and they're talking to each other, trying to figure out what to do. And you will hear them flushing the toilet to cover in case anyone is listening in. That's right. Listen. I wanted to invite you to tomorrow's committee meeting. Meeting? What meeting? Why didn't I know about a meeting? Stalin and Beria put you on a list. Stalin? Oh, I must have wronged him so badly. What did I do? Oh, no, nothing. Don't you see? Beria. He wants you out. Now, I've been talking with Comrade Bulganin. No, no. This I think he's right. We can outvote no, them. No, no, no. This is factionalism, Nikki. No, no, it's Stalin not. Stalin didn't like oh, factionalism. Oh, Stalin is dead. I've seen inside of him. For <laughs> sake, we have to act. I can't believe he's gone. Oh. <laughs> You have to wait for it to fill up. <laughs> Apartments. <sighs> That's <laughs> we had to do the apartments. This is, I mean, this is true. Stalin had these apartments built opposite the Kremlin to put the hierarchy of the Communist Party, you know, the upper, as a, almost like a reward. They had these luxury apartments, and they had their own shopping center and cinema and so on. But the real reason was so he could get them all in the one building. So it's just one building he, he can bug. And he's got everyone. That 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 was the that was the reason. I okay. So you have uh, there are a lot of descriptions uh, uh, in criticism. Of what a brilliant political satirist you are. Um, so congratulations on that. First of all, great. Thank you very much. S second of all, <laughs> um, I I you know we've talked about the fact that you don't think particularly that satire is a particularly effective way to change the world. Mm. Um, 
What do you think satire is when making jokes at people's expense by doing homework may or may not even ha- g- have any purchase? Like when people don't care about it, you know what I mean? Like when the target doesn't care about. Yeah. Are you talking about Donald Trump? I, I don't know. I'm a journalist, so I'm I'm pretty. I you know I, I have I have all perspectives at all times. I mean, I think I, I I'm so glad I'm not doing Veep now, and I I can see why they've taken Selena Meyer away from the White House because any attempt to do a a fictional version of what's happening now would never be as absurd as what's happening now, and I think the. The comics or satirists or whatever, however you want to describe the ones who are having most effect are, are the ones who are, are like journalists, you know, John Oliver and Samantha B and Seth Meyer and, and, and all those who've got teams of researchers who spend a lot of time and a lot of work actually digging out the facts and and just out, outlining the facts for our entertainment just constantly kind of resetting yeah. to the structure of real information. Exactly, because if Trump is saying that the news is fake, then it's it's the comedians that are going, okay, well we'll we'll do the news then. Um, we'll just put a bit more effort, and, and that seems to be what's having most impact, um, rather than doing a, a kind of parody of Trump and 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 all that sort of thing. I think. You know, you've done all this material about the hopelessness Mm. of bureaucracy, Mm. Um, the kind of inherent hopelessness of bureaucracy, whether it's the death of Stalin, which is just about these committee meetings. Mm. It's basically a series of committee meetings, uh, or whether it's Veep in the Thick of It and Mm. In the Loop, which are about the, um, you know, the democratically elected equivalents. Do you actually have any faith? And most comedians have no faith in systems or power structures. Oh, I do. I, I do. Do you? I, and, you know, you write about what it is that interests you. Uh, uh, and I've always been, you know, I'm passionate about politics. I want, I mean, I spent the last election, I spent a lot of time just trying to persuade young first-time voters to register to vote and get out and vote because it, it disturbed me that they were the lowest uh, percentage of of voters that the elderly in the UK, eighty percent of them vote, uh, whereas eighteen to twenty four year olds only you know it was something as low as thirty five thirty six percent of them voted. So uh, and and the reason the election caused such an upset was that actually young people did not through my doing but young people did. I think because of the Brexit vote the year before, a lot of people woke up not having voted in that election, in that referendum, and and realized actually voting does make a difference. I remember my father was, um, uh, he grew up in just outside Naples, and when he was 16, 17, during the Second World War, he he was, he he wrote for an anti-fascist newspaper, and when the war broke out, he became a partisan and fought against the fascists and against Mussolini. When he moved to the UK, he never took out British citizenship, and I said, why don't you? Because you you can't vote unless you've got a passport and stuff. And he said, ah, last election I remember, Mussolini got in. And that was his way of saying, look, don't think democracy is perfect. You know, Hitler got in on a plebiscite. it's not perfect. It has to be defended and participated in and 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 supported and 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 renewed and refreshed. Otherwise, you know, it starts fraying at the edges, and then you get strange things happen in elections, and 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 people come in who do strange things to democracy. Well, here's the good news: because this is public radio, I was required to get you at some point to say plebiscite, and you did. There we go. So yes. we can wrap it up now. Excellent. We're done. Yeah. Armando Inuche, thank you so much for coming back on Bullseye. It's always so great to talk to you. And I am always so excited to see your new work. I'm I'm such a fan and admirer of it. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Armando Iannucci, ladies and gentlemen. The Death of Stalin is in theaters now. Make sure to go see it. It is great. It's hilarious. Amazing. Amazing.